Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. I'm so grateful that you guys tune in to our show every week and sending me love and emails and all the kind messages that you leave on Facebook and iTunes it gives me so much energy to continue this work because as you know, it's this is something I'm doing as a volunteer work and uh, it's just so encouraging to hear from you. On that note, I just want to share with you that we have another two weeks that our survey is going to be up. This is a survey that will take maybe less than a minute, and it gives me an opportunity to hear about the topics that would be interesting to you, because this is a show for you, and I want to make sure the topic we're talking about is relevant to your area of interest. Today, we're going to talk about how is it to be in a relationship with someone who identifies as transgender or someone who is gender fluid. And the reason that I wanted to talk further about this topic, as you guys know, we had two episodes having, we talked about this topic extensively about how is it to parent a transgender kid. And also we talked about gender identity, sexual orientation. But I thought it would be important, and it is important to talk about couples who stay in the relationship after the partner comes out as a transgender. Because I my belief is that we don't, at least I don't necessarily hear the other side of the kind of happy ending that some of these couple get. When I was in undergrad, I was a biochem major and I fell in love with this instructor at UCSD. She was teaching human sexuality and eating disorders. And it's interesting that those are the areas that I specialize in. And she, like in part of her human sexuality class, she gave us this a companion workbook that it was collected the stories of people around their sexuality. And one of the story that was really hard for me to hear was this uh, love story of a woman. Uh, she was telling the story of how she fell in love with her husband and how devastating it was for her when after they got married 20 years later that she realized he identified as a female and then he went through the trans transition and then the the relationship and then and this is a narrative that we often hear so i'm very excited to have dr eva smith to tell us about the couples that she work with and they managed to t- make this relationship work they managed to continue loving each other after the transgender partner come out as a transgender and at time goes to transition as i shared with you our guest is dr eva smith and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist transgender care certified therapist board certified hypnotherapist, board member of the GET Network Foundation, uh, which stands for Gender Equality Trust, and Florida Department of Children and Family Approved Parent Care Provider. She also has a EU earned degree in Master in Psychology and Law and PhD in Clinical Psychology. I'm very excited and honored to have her on the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited to and honored to have Dr. Eva Smidova in our show today. Dr. Eva, welcome to our show. Hello, Dr. Ness. Great. Uh, very thankful for having me. No, I am very excited about this conversation. Please call me Naz. And because this is a topic that they're not necessarily many of my colleagues know much about when it comes to transgender clients, people in the community, people are at some levels, they are familiar with the kind of challenges of like children growing up in the families and coming out to their families as transgenders, but there are not necessarily many 
therapists that are in tune with challenges of coming out to the cisgender partner. So we're very grateful to have you here. Thank you. And no, Dr. Eva, I'm good with Eva. So Nas Eva will work. I guess <laughs> Perfect. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so let us start with talking about what is the process of coming out to cisgender partner it might look like. I understand that it's definitely very different for each person, but I'm kind of curious about what are some of the common themes that you notice? Regarding, we start with a very difficult topic because for uh, all, I, I would say there is no exception. For uh, transgender uh, ladies and, and uh, gentlemen, the coming out means fear. That's, that's where, where it is uh, in the process of just incubation in the process of thinking about about coming out. I think that we have to look at the difficulty of coming out. Violence is of that the one gender non-conforming transgender uh, female or male who lived in their assigned gender role as this role was perceived, seen, expected from them. Can you imagine the unconditional love? Can you imagine what, whatever, how much hard work it is for the particular one just to make everyone happy when inside they are very unhappy? Not norm requires, because they are born as not norm and they do not know about it, they do not know that even yet. Not norm requires figuring out that I am not a norm, but also to gain a good level of courage to get to the point when it feels somehow all right. Lots of the time, the coming out happens when it's peace. Like it looks good in the, in the particular family system, in the relationship, in marriage. It means that the, the individual gets enough confidence or another thing, I deserve that. I took care of everyone and everything. And now I think it might be my turn. Compassion and thoughtfulness is a many, many, many times, or I would even say always, or 99.9% .9 of the time, it's exactly the case. I first think about anyone else, every single one, first, and then it's my turn. That's the difficulty, because it has advantages and disadvantages, double-edged sword. What is right and what is not is, un is unfortunately dictated by society. Yet, all of us, we have a choice and we may choose and pick what society members we surround ourselves by. That's what I always say. So it means when I am coming out, many times it happens outside of the family system, meaning uh, when, when I feel that my acceptance might work out well, that I, I might get the positive feedback, I might be accepted, or it happens within the family system when I cannot go anywhere further, I just have to, the pressure is just extreme, and what is before the coming out, it's permanently debating, discussing within myself if, if, if this is the good time, and Clients very often ask me, when is the good time? And I am always laughing. There is never a good time to, to come <laughs> that out. That is true. Because it's, it's always like sur surprising, shocking for the people uh, who, who live with you, who live with that, with that particular individual. But shocking is this question mark. Really? Because when we then look, look back at that and we start re revising the story of the beloved one who is gender non-conforming, transgender, we find always like a very solid, consistent story that was uh, was existing between the lines the whole entire time. Even when we look in, at the childhood of that particular individual, might not be the typical preferred isomorphic group or the typical toys of the express gender. No, not always that's the case. But there are 
patterns that may made that particular individual always somehow different, somehow special. It's more about what we pay attention to and what we do not pay attention to. So that what comes before the coming out and when the coming out happens, it's always shock. Right. And I can only imagine even in the communities that are safer, because obviously there are some communities that's even it's like risk to people's safety when they're coming out. But even in the communities that you're right, that there are more sense of safety, it can be a huge shock to the uh, wife, husband, to the children. So it's going to be a long and I can imagine most of the time painful process. Is that your experience? You know what? With, with that being said, the fear of the social uh, judgment and the lack of acceptance is unfortunately happening most of the time, and fortunately and unfortunately, because it makes things complicated. Uh, it is more happening in, in the heads and in the hearts of uh, the gender non-conforming individual kind of, because transgender ladies and gentlemen are so much under the pressure, their own pressure, to be or not to be, Shakespeare question, <laughs> literally. Uh, however, the fear of not being accepted, being rejected, is is uh, is permanent. It it uh, it exists always. And unfortunately, this is this is the the, the feeling, the the vibe that is getting the the family system too. However, I am not saying that this is really how 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 it is in a society, because in general, the society in 2018 is okay accepting, and the fear, unfortunately, the pressure, lots of the time just exists within the family system, meaning the people, the the close ones, are more worried, more concerned than really the the the, the impact, the 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 answer, the response from the from the society is. So unfortunately it's a lot of fear and, and hesitation. So the panic within within the family does not really reflect uh, the response that usually in 2018 is is coming is coming from 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 society, really, really not. So the numbers based by survey and research are much better in the real world than the worries and concerns in the that that is in the in the family system. Oh, that is refreshing to hear. And it kind of makes <laughs> me wonder about how common do you see the even in your practice that when the partner comes out as a transgender, the cisgender husband, wife decide to continue with the marriage. Is that a common thing? At the beginning, I would say that yes. Uh, the numbers how many how many people get uh, divorced right after coming out or how many couples just break up right after coming out are about 30 30 percent oh yeah 30 percent but these are just the first numbers because lots of the time couples they want to try they they want to take the journey together do whatever they need to do and they want to try however Lots of the time after trying, I'm not saying that they are really very successful. I would say 50-50. And when I was thinking, uh, how come? How we can make, how we can help them, how we can make, make it better. It's more about how much comfortable, embedded, used to their old habits and routines the people were in the relationship uh, before the, the coming uh, coming out. The coming out is kind of proof of of the of the strength of the of the of the relationship. If the relationship held um, what enough that was able to get them over difficult times and, and crisis. Because we have relationships and they have crisis, but maybe not the big, big crisis. This one is a big one. 
So maybe that Steinberg's triangular theory of love that put the, or divided love into uh, the section of intimacy, passion, and commitment might help. I would say that the couples that have chance to survive after after the coming out would be couples where intimacy and commitment is a lot, would be probably two thirds, or maybe it would be the the whole entire pie. Commitment, meaning that I love you. And I know why I do love you. I know all your qualities. I know who you are. And and I know you really well. And because of that, I am here for you. And I will and I will I will continue no matter what. Because when we look at couples, people who survive coming out or happy couples, then this is exactly it. The couples are committed couples. Their their relationship is based on very close and deep friendship. And friendship, when I say it's a friendship with capital F, meaning I do whatever I have to do and need to do and love to do for you. And I know I will get it back. These are the couples that who survive. And, you know, I'm kind of curious to see about the intimacy part, because I, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, so gender identity and sexual orientation is different. So if someone's gender identity doesn't necessarily tra- translate that their sexual orientation going to change as well. So I guess it depends. The 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 way that the relationship changes in the bedroom also, I can imagine if that that was my relationship that can impact uh, whether I can stay with the partner or not, as far as whether our erotic template still would be compatible. So I guess first I wanted to ask you about, I know in your presentation, you talked about gender identity and sexual identity. Tell us a little bit about what are the differences between those two? Mm -hmm. Transgender or gender, better, sorry, uh, gender identity. (laughs) It has a kind of uh, complicated explanation, but I have simple one too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that. <laughs> uh, if, we, if, if, we, if we get lost. Uh, gender identity defined by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, RKA, uh, aka WPATH, Standards of Care, is that gender identity is a category of social identity associated with an identity of an individual as a woman, man, or other. Gender is used as a classification of a social role that a particular individual lives in and represents, such as male or female, no matter if it is or it's not compliant with particular social constructs. That's the official, that's the official explanation. However, from my point of view, uh, the gender identity is pretty much personal sensation of being male or female, regard no matter what uh, what the social gender stereotype, the social contracts say. So it's my sensation of being male or female. That's it. That's it. that's the easy one. And regarding sexual identity, I put together that sexual identity is a unique individual expression fulfillment and differentiation or self-actualization in an intimate sexual role. How do you like that? <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I, when I, that's my definition. And uh, when I was putting this definition together, I was, I was feeling like being in bed <laughs> <laughs> and thinking <laughs> what would work for me? What, what I really want? The fulfillment, being able to express, give love my way. So that's that's what I think the sexual identity is. It is 
uh, in general, it is it is uh, put together with the biological sex and um, and uh, sexual orientation because sexual orientation is considered to be part of sexual sexual identity. You know, as marrying gender nonconforming or transgender individual, transgenders are transgenders like all entire life. When I am marrying someone who is transgender, and I do not know that, I am marrying someone who is unique. Probably, when we are talking about uh, transgender ladies, not necess- even even transgender gentlemen, they are they are in general more empathetic, more sympathetic, more compassionate. They are unique beings. They they are different. And uh, their partners, I strongly believe, because that's what I see on a daily basis. They give, they bring to the relationship something phenomenal, something unique. Period. So it means even even in the in the in the sexual area, sex, love, intimacy. Part of that is romance, romantic. And literally, transgender individuals are phenomenal at that, period. So, regarding sexual intimacy itself, I have couples uh, where the sexual intimate part is not a problem at all. It's all about love, mutual love giving, love getting. And then I have couples where the sexual intimacy is just doesn't work at all. And the reason why it does not work at all is that the couple just too much got to use the old-fashioned kind of habit, love, getting, and giving. And it was too much about the biological, the assigned biological sex gender, meaning in case of uh, transgender ladies, it was um, too much the guy loving but when I when you when I would have a, one of the transgender ladies here and I would ask her okay so it was the typical male guy loving where were you at that moment when you were when you were giving the love and I would probably get an answer that at that time I was not even there I was just doing the job or I was the woman. <laughs> And the and the, and the woman meaning the partner, the female partner at that intimate moment. So I guess I'm trying to make sure I'm getting it right. So you say when, as far as like when the intimacy is more than just physical exchange between mm-hmm. partners, mm-hmm. it's usually mm-hmm. people can make it work. But if they're yep. kind of like stuck in this kind of mode of male to female, kind of more like biological exchange. That gets mm-hmm. tricky when that dynamic changes. Absolutely right. I have couples again when when the when the biological part is the their biological sex, it's not an issue. I even I like funny and I love it. I love it. I love it. My transgender ladies, the new generation, the young young adults, people in their twenties. <laughs> My transgender ladies run into until the moment when they when they just get together a typical heterosexual guy, very good looking and unbelievable or believable. They just make it work because transgender ladies very often in their like young twenties not afraid to experiment, lively, passionate are able to make it work and they are able to offer things that I don't know cis cis females cannot offer that's that's I think that that's what uh, the contribution of the new without gender boundaries world will probably will probably offer or will be able to offer more and more so definitely if there is an acceptance if there is curiosity that's a big one, curiosity, then yes, I strongly believe, and I have proof, evidence, 
that couples are able to make it work. And not all, not only that, have fun working, <laughs> working on that. Yeah, speaking of spicing things up, because I had years and years couples doing the same thing. But if we're mm-hmm. kind of introducing this element of excitement and change, that might can even improve the intimacy and sex. I can see that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like in with any any other crisis in, in relationships. When we put our hands on it and we really, really want, no doubt we will make it work. <laughs> I guess I, the other part of spectrum is that for people who, for any reason, the relationship ends and they start dating again, what are your recommendations as for us? When is a good time to disclose that they are there's someone that's kind of identify as transgender. I would love to say that there is a, already a rule or or a template, uh, what is the right way, how to do it. But no, there is not. I highly recommend honesty because this is something that cis partners complain about like that they were betrayed, uh, that they were lied through the whole entire relationship. But it's it's just um, not really true. It's just um, a different perspective because as I said at the beginning, the particular transgender individual first tries to take care of everyone and everything first. And the mindset is, Everyone is more important than me. So betrayal, I really don't think so because it's just a different perspective. And with the dating, it's the, it's the same thing. Uh, we can look at that from a, from two different angles. One, I want to be 100% honest and I want uh, to let you know who I am because my gender identity, my gender pride is already like very well established, very well developed. So I am proud, proud of who I am. This is what I see with the young generation of, of gender non-conforming individuals. Lots of people like that. And then I have a little bit different angle and a little bit different perspective. And it is... I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to be judged before the people get a chance to know me for who I really am without any labels. Which one is the right one, right? Question mark. Uh, however, that's the reason why a lot of uh, gender nonconforming people start their finding a partner online, chatting, playing games communicating, um, getting together with people online, meaning lots of the time or all the time they use their expressed gender. They are those who they really are. And with that or under that gender identity, meaning the expressed one, they come across plenty of people. They have a chance to develop a relationship um, and people start to know them and have a chance to know them for who they really are, meaning their personal qualities, meaning they, they, yeah, they, their personal human, human qualities. And I think, as you mentioned, that can be very, very vulnerable. I can see the pros and cons of each approaches because I can see with the first one, you're kind of truly showing up as who you are. And then, you know, people like sexual partners or romantic partners, they can either accept it or not. You don't necessarily get put yourself in the position of kind of the person, the partner realizing uh, about your gender identity and rejecting you. That can be very painful. And But I can also see the benefit of second one. For example, like similar to any other sexual behavior, I wouldn't, if I was dating, I wouldn't necessarily bring up my sexual preferences, things I like in the bedroom on the day one, Mm -hmm. right? It Mm -hmm. will take a while. I want to see, okay, if I like you, and then we go from kind of after that, we're kind of talking about my preferences. Absolutely. Absolutely. So first of all, likability, meaning there is something that I like about you. I like the way how you look. I like the way how you act. 
So very often the disclosure regarding uh, regarding um, transgenderism, gender identity comes, I would say, second date or the end of the of the first date, maybe. But I would say quite early, quite early in the relationship. So it is not like it used to be with the older generation of uh, transgender individuals, where the social pressure was more or less dictating what is what is what you have to do. Period. There was less less options because they were not accepted or allowed or even just open. We have a huge advantage now. Lots of people already took the transgender, the transition journey. So people these days, they see that we have options, that our journey that other people before me tried, and they succeeded. And that's phenomenal. The more positive examples we have, the more encouraging it is for everyone. For example, I have a very fresh couple now with a transgender lady, both of them in their late 20s, and being able to connect them with other people just like them, other couples, that's phenomenal. That's very encouraging. So if I say that one month and a half ago, I might have here people who were absolutely bewildered, very kind of giving up mode. One month and a half later, I have people who are more confident or they are becoming more confident because suddenly they have a vision of a journey how it might go and how it might look like that maybe not so much might change in our relationship. It's more about encouraging them to keep investing, to keep re-exploring, not to be afraid of of challenges and rather taking the challenge as as something painful, hurdle, no. Like something that might bring refreshment, something that might bring something new, something that might make us absolutely amazing and unique. So rather focusing on the on the on the positive aspects of that phenomenal challenge. Awesome. I always like to end on a positive note. <laughs> And I'm glad that you you shared with us there is hope. There are couples that make it work, which which is so no important. Doubt. Yes, because at times people hear the stories of uh, losses and grief, which can be part of people's narrative. But there are other way of relating, and people, if they choose to, they can continue with the relationship. If I want to make sure people know where to get a hold of you, because you have such an interesting and niche experience and clinical experience. So what would be the best way for our listeners to get in contact with you? Probably. My website is ideal. They will will find all contacts, my phone number, my email, all of that. So email, absolutely phenomenal because most of the time I'm in therapy office with uh, people. I'm a big cheerleader. (laughs) (laughs) So I am surrounding. I want to live a positive story. And the choice of the story is a choice. Each of us has a choice to feed ourselves with a, with a good story or listen to and feed ourselves with a miserable story. I am all for good stories. So definitely, it's about love. It's about investment. It's about compassion. And unconditional love is not huh, typical in uh, typical regular relationships with a transgender uh, ladies and gentlemen and this gender non-conforming people, the unconditional love is what I want. It's all is exactly what all of us want. And when we have that, nothing can stop the success. Great. So thank you again so much for all this wonderful knowledge and wisdom that you gave us. I make sure that people uh, find your email address, your phone number and the website and the show note. And again, it was so lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Eva. I appreciate uh, hearing her experience uh, working with couples, working it through different transitions in the relationship and how having a commitment and open mind can make some of these challenges as a point of strength in future. At the end, I wanted to remind you guys that if you have a question, you can email the question to us at drmoali at sexologypodcast.com or you can record your voice at our website, uh, sexologypodcast.com, and we can answer it on the show. It's usually, it would be me or another therapist. Uh, so if you got a question, if you got many answers, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.